thank you to the praise team this morning, and especially for Peggy, our, our music minister, Willard, is away today celebrating 50 years at another church, and uh, Peggy's graciously uh, stepped in to use her gifts to lead us in music, so thank you a lot. <clears throat> if this may be your first Sunday with us, if you want to fill out a, a guest card, there's usually a white card in front of you, please do that, so I can get in touch with you, or one of our pastoral team can get in touch with you, but we're so glad that you're here at Fairview today. Well, what we've been uh, doing over the last few months is, is uh, really teaching, learning, preaching through the Gospel of Mark. And so this morning, if you would like to turn with me, we are in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. At the very end of that chapter... And I'm going to begin reading with verse 34. Mark 8, beginning with verse 34. The gospel says this. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. But whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord today. Well, let me first say, if if you really want to study and pray and act on, on what to do as a follower of Jesus, you need to study these passages we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. Mark chapter 8 is a great chapter to learn what it means to be a Christian and what it means to follow Jesus. What do we do after that? We learned last week in Peter's great confession when Jesus asked the disciples, Who do you say that I am? Peter gave us the first step. Peter said, You are the Christ, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And that's the first step. We have got to realize in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Son of God. And that brings salvation. Now, the passage we we read today goes to the next step. And it's really Mark's definition and Jesus' definition of what it means to be a Christian what it means to be a follower of our Lord. Now, and I think we, because of some, and I hate to say it, preachers, and of some literature out there, we sometimes begin to get the wrong picture or the wrong promise of what it means to be a Christian only. You see, following Jesus is not akin to us going out in a couple of months on a nice, beautiful, humid-free fall afternoon walk with a leisurely picnic basket in hand and just enjoying the day. That's not all that it's about, about following Jesus, is it? Following Jesus is not always a picnic because life happens. But the Christian journey, as, as we find it in the Bible... It's more like the journey of life that's filled with twists and turns. It's a life filled with the unknown. It, it, it's a life that, that involves risk. It's a life that, that sometimes involves being uncomfortable. And it's a life that's full of lots of change. Lots of stuff that we can never imagine, isn't it? And we do all of that as a Christian, the Bible says, and what Jesus is saying, we do all of this for the sake of the kingdom of God. In other words, being a Christian is a life of great adventure. It's a great adventure. It's the great unknown. Yet we know the unknown 
because we know what happens in the end and when we die or when Jesus comes again, don't we? Heaven. Or maybe you didn't have that thing, that thought about Christianity. Maybe you suppose that, um, that when you became a Christian would be that you made a few adjustments in your everyday life and this moved on with whatever you wanted to do. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, don't shoot me, I'm just a messenger. That's not the way it is. You see, think of Jesus. Jesus didn't choose the cross because of the great life benefits it would bring to him, did he? The cross was a tough road. The cross is a horrendous death. The cross is great sacrifice. But he chose the cross because he knew it was God's will for him. And Jesus is saying that those who follow him and become his disciples must follow the same path. The same path of selfless surrender to the Father's will. Or the same path of the cross. And he breaks it down into into three, I think, very memorable, easy things for us to meditate on and to live our Christian life on. The first thing he says is, those that want to follow me must deny yourself. What an odd description to begin to explain what it means to live as a Christian. you got to deny yourself. I don't hear that much in commercials on TV. Man, I noticed Billy said it's football season, so I was watching some college football yesterday. I bet nine out of every ten ads was why we need to have a new car. You know, <laughs> this is the time to buy a new car, to lease a new car. You know, if you want to be fulfilled in life, take care of yourself, drive a new car, swim in debt, and that's the way to be happy. It's about me because you deserve a new car, don't you? You deserve something pretty. You deserve leather and on star. But what an odd description to Jesus says, no, if you want to follow me, the first thing to do to really get contentment and, and happiness in your life, deny yourself. Does Jesus mean that we're to lose our unique personalities, our joy to follow him? Or would he lose our freedom and become slaves to this set of rules and regulations that that's how we think of the Bible? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is that when we decide to follow him, our one desire in our hearts needs to become to turn away from idolatry and to turn away from self-centeredness. We learn because of all the love Jesus has given us that life is not about satisfying ourselves. Wow. During our Christian walk, what we learn is, is that it is ourselves and our desire to please others and ourselves only is replaced by giving Jesus first place in all that we do. And that's a very difficult lifestyle to adopt, isn't it? Isn't that a tough place to get to? Because our human nature, this will be said before, is to look out for number one. Our human nature is to demand our own way, isn't it? Our, own, our, our human nature is, is for us, you know, if something's not going our way, is to, to cry and pout and, and, and you know, demand it. And one way we can really see this struggle is even within the church and church membership. I, I've been talking to and communicating a lot with Tom Rayner, who's written a lot of great practical books on being a church member. And he said in one of his books that, um, that he made up a new word, he said. He said, Christianity in many modern believers today, especially church members, is the principle that it's not Christianity, it's churchianity. So he made up this word, churchianity. And he says churchianity, his definition is, it's people practicing church. It's people practicing religious beliefs according to human standards rather than biblical teaching. 
That's churchianity. Now, our behavior that results from churchianity is the idea, we get this idea in our head, and this goes to self-absorption, that church is about me. Church is about me. It's having this country club mentality about belonging to the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. It's not the body of you. And here is when you know a person living out their faith, it's all about them attitude versus denying themselves as Jesus commands. You'll hear statements like this every now and then in churchianity conversations in the church house. I've heard most of them through my years. One, you know, you might hear, I told the pastor what I wanted him to preach. He just doesn't listen to me. <laughs> that's, that's churchianity. I don't like the temperature in the worship center. <laughs> Have you ever heard that one? If we don't change our music style, I'm not coming back. I'll find another church that can meet my needs. Or maybe we say, gosh, we pay the, the staff and the pastors to do those things. I'm not doing them. You get the picture, don't you? That's churchianity, not Christianity. Biblical church membership is about denying ourselves, sacrifice, servanthood, so that Christ is preached and glorified and not us. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says to follow me. We've got to deny ourselves. We've got to do what really is tough to do. We've got to resist all of the human nature talking to us. And we've got to listen to the spirit that says, when you become a Christian, you're saying, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is number one. Not me anymore. The second thing, Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily. Now, this second teaching really is a twin of the first commandment. It's talking almost about the same thing. The victim of crucifixion, and we saw that Jesus had to do it too. Not only were you going to be crucified, but you had to carry your own cross to your crucifixion site. You had to carry the instrument. It would be like strapping an electric chair on your back if you were going to be electrocuted and carry it into the room and hook it up. Jesus had to carry his own cross up to Golgotha, Calvary, where he would be crucified. So for us to take up our cross or mission, Jesus is saying that to take up our cross, he's requiring of us absolute commitment to him. Absolute commitment to him. And he's also saying he is not asking us to do anything he hasn't already done. Jesus has carried his cross, hasn't he? He says, I've shouldered my cross for you. I've shouldered the Father's will. I've died for humanity for their sin. All I'm asking you to do is just shoulder your little old cross and carry out my commandments and my will for your life. So bearing our cross, I think through the years, what it doesn't mean, and a lot of people have attributed to this, bearing our cross doesn't mean bearing up during a terrible event in your life. It's not suffering. It, it, it's not living with a shortcoming or a physical handicap that you have. Or as Paul said, a thorn in their flesh, as he had. But bearing our cross is to make this conscious choice to follow Jesus all the way. It's to make this conscious choice to take on the burdens of others. It's the conscious choice to deny ourselves, to place ourselves without reservation at the service of Jesus Christ. That's what bearing our cross means. So we're to deny ourselves, we're to take up our cross daily, and you know the third one, right? If you're reading the scripture, if you remember it, follow me. Then we're ready to follow Jesus. And literally what, what this follow me, what, what Jesus is saying in the original language is, is make it your habit to follow my example. 
Make it your habit to follow Jesus. In other words, this command interprets the first two. When we deny ourselves, when we take up our cross daily, what that means is, what we do is, is that our habit becomes to follow Jesus. You know, we said how hard it is to to not live for ourselves because that's habit. But if we can really practice taking up the cross, we can really practice denying ourselves, our habits can change. Our habits can change. Our natural reaction, our, our nature starts to become caring for others instead of us. You know you're diving deeper into the Lord Jesus Christ when that begins to happen in your life. This is how we're, we're ever, we could ever expect to obey the first commandments. The only way is to follow Jesus. It's to have the desire, the passion, the ability to allow Jesus to change us and live through us. How do we do this? Well, uh, the four ways that have been through Christendom and what Scripture teaches. The way we achieve this is that we abide in His Word. We abide in the Bible. We pray in the faith. We have constant communication with our Lord. We fellowship with other believers. We we receive nurture. And we learn how to pour out our lives in the service of other people by fellowshipping in a local church. That's why it's awful hard to live out the Christian faith at home in front of the TV preacher, isn't it? we got to learn to interact and live with each other. And fourth, we, we, we need to witness to the world. We need to sh- bear the cross in sharing our faith. We need to be so excited about following Jesus that we talk to others wherever and whoever we are. Well, this is what we call the cost of discipleship. Is that cost too much for you? No, it, it shouldn't be because we have to look not at this life only, but the eternal picture. And that's why Jesus goes on to say, you know, if you focus on self, you say, okay, I'm not buying that. I'm going to focus on myself all of my life. I want the best house, the best car, uh, the best job. Uh, Whoever dies with the most money wins. You know, Jesus says, gain all that. Go ahead. Will you do all of that to forfeit your own eternal soul? You're not looking at the big picture. The big picture is not the nest egg you have in retirement. The big picture is where are you going to spend eternity. We need to have eternal eyes. So are you ready for the Christian journey? Have you gone all in? Have you given everything you have to Jesus? He gives us a very upside-down truth of living that we're not hearing anywhere else in our society, isn't he? But the upside-down sounding way that he's giving us, Jesus says, leads to fulfillment. It leads to peace. It leads to contentment. And it leads to eternal life. And that's why... All of us sit here today because we believe that. Let's just live it a little more. And if you're here today and you haven't believed that, if you're on the fence and, gosh, what is Jesus all about? That's a lot about what he's all about. You can ask him in your heart. Just say, and we're going to do that in just a second with communion. And that's what communion's about. It's reminding us how we can have this life, isn't it? You're going to take that piece of bread and, that we give you and you're going to put it into the, the, the juice. And the bread is Jesus' body that was broken and given for you. He died for you on the cross. And, and that, that juice that you put the bread in, that's his blood. You know, his blood, he paid the penalty for your sin. And when you believe that, really believe that, then the Bible says you're saved. They use those words. The Bible does. 
And you have eternal life. I said this morning, that's like the, when they asked me if I, if I want whipped cream on my milkshake and a cherry. Why not? You bet. If I'm having a milkshake, I want all the whipped cream you can pour on there and the cherry. Heaven's the whipped cream and the cherry. The meat of it, the milkshake is, you've been forgiven of your sin. And you have salvation right now. We're going to remember that in communion here in just a minute. Our praise team, or our instruments are going to come up and play something. We're going to have a station over here where you can come and remember what Jesus did for you with the bread and with the juice and over here. And um, after I pray, I just want you to invite you to come up and, um, and to do that. And as you dip that bread into the juice, remember Jesus died for me. And if you need to talk to somebody about asking Christ in your heart, I want you to come to me. Let me talk to you, okay? All right, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for calling us to this great adventure. Thank you for not just uh, saying you're going to save us and forget us and let us lead a dull life of, uh, of houses and cars and junk, but you give us meat. You give us excitement. You give us thrills. And Lord, thank you for reminding us that through the bread and through the cup this morning. We praise you, we worship you for what you've done for us, and we pray in your name. Amen.